Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17 and we're going to talk about ravens, widows, and angels. 1 Kings chapter 17. While you find your way there, just want to remind you that today we're celebrating the halfway mark on our Jump In Capital campaign. In the fall of 2013, our church family pledged to give $3 million over three years for the construction of phase two. Since then, our pledge total has been increased by another half a million dollars. So the campaign total that has been promised is three and a half million dollars. And we're at the halfway mark and so far we have received $1.7 million. So we are right on target, we're right on track. But in order to finish phase two, we need all of that money that was pledged to come in and we're gonna need a little bit more as well. I know we have many visitors today and, and we welcome you. Thank you for your patience with uh, our construction mess outside. But if Harvest Time Church is your home, then at the end of the service today, we're going to ask if you would pray about bringing a commitment card to the altar and committing to do one of four things for the remaining 18 months of this campaign. First of all, many of us are still working on our pledges that we made in fall of 2013. And so um, maybe today we just would ask you to reaffirm that commitment and say, uh, Lord, I don't know exactly how all the numbers are going to work out. I don't know how the math is going to work out, but I'm trusting that in the next 18 months by December of 2016, that number that you put on my heart in the fall of 2013, you're going to help me to complete and to give. And um, just asking God for fresh faith uh, to finish that commitment. We have a number of people who have already finished your giving to your pledge, or you're substantially finished giving to your pledge. And maybe the Lord would like to use you to do a little bit more to help us finish the campaign and finish phase two. And you can pledge an additional amount. We have a lot of people that are new to our church since the fall of 2013. You weren't here when we made our pledges 18 months ago, but you're part of our family now. And maybe this is the time for you to jump in and make a pledge for the remaining 18 months of the campaign. And some people like to give one-time gifts, and you can indicate that on the card as well. I'm going to add a fifth category that's not on the card. There are four different uh, ways to commit on the card. I'm going to add a fifth category. Uh, and maybe you're just in a place where you really have absolutely nothing in your hand to give right now. You know, Peter and John were there. Uh, they met a lame beggar outside of the temple and they said to him, we don't have any silver or any gold. That's how you know that Peter and John were real Pentecostals. <laughs> silver and gold have I none. But they did have something valuable they could give and that was their prayers in the name of Jesus. And maybe that's you right now. Maybe you're a real Pentecostal right now. You don't have silver or gold but there is something valuable that you can still contribute to phase two and that's your prayers. And if that's you, you can just write in a fifth category on the bottom of that card, write it in, uh, such as I have, my prayers I give to you. Look with me in 1 Kings chapter 17 and I wanna talk to you very quickly about ravens, widows, and angels this morning. 1 Kings 17, beginning in verse one. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishba in Gilead said to King Ahab of Israel, as the Lord God lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth ravine east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have commanded ravens to supply you with food there. So Elijah did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan. He stayed there and the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go to once at Zarephath in the land of, Z of Sidon and stay there and I have commanded a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called and said, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? As she turned to get it, he called, and please, bring me a piece of bread. 
As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. And I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we might eat it and die. Cheery sort of widow she was. <laughs> but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first... Make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son for this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day that the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah, for the woman and her son for the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Now we won't read the next couple of verses, but if you read on in the story, you find out that during this time the woman's son got sick and he got worse and worse every day until he died. But Elijah, the woman was angry with Elijah. She said, why did you come to my house? Your presence here, you're a man of God and your presence here, it has directed God's attention toward me and he saw my sin and he punished me and took away my son. But Elijah prayed for the boy and the boy came back to life. So look at verse 24, the last verse in the chapter. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. Let's pray and just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence that we feel here. Thank you for your people. Father, may we encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees, would you just say amen and amen with me. When God wants to bless you, he presents you with an opportunity to give. He presents you with an opportunity to serve. That is the story of the widow of Zarephath. That has been our story here at Harvest Time Church for the last 31 years and that will be the story of phase two. We've been sharing with you over the last couple weeks how our new building is not really about a new building. It's about God's mission in the world. It's about God's family. It's about our call to be a light. And the Jump In campaign is about so much more than fundraising. It's about an invitation to jump into God's economy. Jump in is an invitation for you to grow your faith. It's an invitation for you to increase your capacity to sow and to reap, to give and to receive from God. It's an invitation for you to watch God do something miraculous with your cup of flour and your tablespoon of oil. You know, we've given you commitment cards. We've asked you, if you're part of our family, to bring one today. If the Lord puts on your heart, we, we should have really called these invitation cards. Because that's what they really are. It's an invitation for God to do miracles of provision in your family and through your family. Some people wonder, why do I have to make a commitment? Why can't I just give as I feel led by the Holy Spirit? Well, that is certainly your prerogative. But I'd ask you to just consider two thoughts. First of all, on the practical side of things, our board and our building committee, as we begin to build this building, we need to know how much we can anticipate receiving from our congregation. Any of you who have ever built anything know that uh, all the way through you have to make decisions based on the budget that you have to work with. And as we uh, build the building, we, we need to have a sense of how much we're going to receive. And on the spiritual side of things, this is an exercise of faith for you. It's about hearing from God yourself. Hearing a number that maybe is a reach for you. Maybe it's a little overwhelming. God, I don't know how we're going to do that. But trusting God to deliver that sum of money through your hands. And if you haven't heard from the Lord about a pledge, I pray that perhaps as we share today, you'll hear something from him. Looking at the life of Elijah, I want to share some encouraging words with you about God's economy. Some encouraging words about God's economy. First, this. God 
will take care of you. In Romans 8, Paul wrote these encouraging words. He said, and we know this, that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. How many people here love God? How many people here are called according to his purpose? Uh, see, some of you aren't sure. Let me, give you, let me give you a hint. If you're born again, you are called according to God's purpose. So how many people here are called according to God's purpose? If you love God and you are called according to his purpose, God will take care of you. God will take care of you like he took care of Elijah. God will guide you. I want you to notice how God guided every one of Elijah's footsteps. He told Elijah precisely where to go. He, he told Elijah what he could expect to find there. He told Elijah how long to stay. He told Elijah when it was time to move on. You know, even when Elijah ran off in his own direction for a little bit, God still guided him. God didn't abandon him. God protected him. God preserved him. God sent angels to help him. God caught up with him and he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And God told him how to get back on course today. And I believe that God wants to minister an encouraging word to someone in this place today. God wants to be your guide. He wants to tell you where to go. He wants to tell you what you can expect to find there. He wants to tell you how long to stay, where to go next. And if you're someone who has gone off in your own direction, God wants you to know that he has been watching over you all this time. He's preserved you all this time. You already know there were some situations that could have taken you out. But for the grace of God, you're still here. And God has run down the road ahead of you. And he has a question for you. What are you doing here? And if you'll only look to him, God will steer you back on the right course for your life again. God will take care of you. He will guide you and he will hide you. For three and a half years, Elijah was in the Father's Witness Protection Program. <laughs> Ahab sent bounty hunters everywhere, but God hid Elijah. Jezebel was killing all the prophets, but God hid Elijah. The people were frustrated. They wanted an end to the famine, but God hid Elijah. God hid Elijah right under their noses. He hid Elijah first in the wilderness that was Elijah's home turf. And then he moved Elijah and hid Elijah on Jezebel's home turf. In fact, people became convinced that God was making Elijah appear and disappear like a spirit because no one could find him anywhere. And God will hide you too. God will hide you from those who want to hurt you. God will hide you from those who want to take out their frustrations on you. For those who want to pressure you, God will hide you in time of trouble in the world. He'll hide you in time of social unrest. He'll hide you when persecution breaks out. David said, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. God will take care of you. He will hide you. He will guide you. And God will provide for you. Yes. Beloved, listen. Be encouraged by the word of the Lord today. When you love God and you are called according to his purpose, God commands provision over your life. God told Elijah, go to the Kareth brook. I have commanded ravens to feed you there. What a miracle that was. In a season of drought and famine, God fed Elijah like a king. Bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank water from a brook. Think about it. Ravens are named for their ravenous appetite. And, but God said, you're giving up your dinner today. Yeah. And then when the brook dried up, God told Elijah, go to Zarephath. I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Later, when Elijah was in the desert, God sent an angel of provision to bring him bread and water. When you love God and you are called according to his purpose, God commands provision over you. Listen to me. You are not your family's provider. God is your family's provider. 
He gave you the opportunity to work. He gave you the ability to work. Your business is not your provider. Your practice is not your provider. Your trade is not your provider. Your employer is not your provider. God is your provider. Your employer is just the raven that God happens to be using today. And every time you get your paycheck, you ought to wave that stub in the air and say, thank you, God, for this raven. And when you write your tithe check, don't forget to say, thank you, God, for this raven. And listen to me, someone take faith this morning. If the source that God is using today should dry up, then God will command provision over your life from somewhere else. And if there's no one else around for God to use, God will send angels of provision to you. But no matter what, whether by ravens or widows or angels, God will take care of you. Somebody take faith this morning. Somebody be in courage this morning. Jesus said, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat and what you'll drink and what you'll wear. Look at the birds of the air, how your heavenly father feeds them. And you are so much more valuable. Look at the lilies of the field. Not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like those lilies. So don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear. The pagans run after those things, but your heavenly father knows what you need. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's a good promise right there. Beloved, God will take care of you. If you believe that, you can do anything. If you believe that, you can get through anything. You can endure anything. You can overcome anything. God will take care of you. Encouraging words about God's economy. God will take care of you. And second, God will take care of his work on earth through you. Sometimes our success in ministry becomes the very source of our next crisis. As a result of Elijah's own prophetic word, the brook that he was relying upon dried up. You know, Elijah did everything right. His forecast was spot on, and as a result, he found himself in serious need. He became the victim of his own ministry success. And you know, sometimes we find ourselves in the same situation. Our ministry success creates new needs that we never anticipated. You know, we wouldn't need phase two if we hadn't filled up phase one six days a week, six nights a week and six times every weekend. When you add up all the worship services, the discipleship classes, the teen programs, the children's programs, our Spanish congregation, our Brazilian fellowship, Messiah's house, our Filipino fellowship, when you add it all up, you know, well over 2,000 people every week pass through this little building. <laughs> We've been too successful. So the house is too small for the family now. Sometimes your brook dries up and then God gives you outrageous instructions to grow your faith. God told Elijah to do an absolutely outrageous thing. He said, Elijah, leave the borders of Israel. Go to Jezebel's homeland. Find a widow there and ask her for food and lodging. That was just so wrong on so many levels. Ahab's bounty hunters were out everywhere. And who wouldn't notice a Jewish prophet living in a Gentile town? And Jews weren't supposed to eat non-kosher food. And prophets weren't supposed to live with single mothers. But worst of all, she was a poor widow raising a son in a famine. How could God put upon her the burden of feeding one of his prophets. What is that? I mean, God is the one who has commanded that we take care of the widows and the orphans. God himself said, I will be the defender and the provider for widows and orphans. So how could God send his man to freeload off this widowed single mother? You know, whenever God is working in the world, God always plays a multi-level chess game. 
You ever seen those chess masters who are playing three-tiered on a three-tiered board? They're playing sometimes three or more games of chess at once. You know, I can barely get through one game of chess with my son, let alone handle three games at a time. But whenever God works, he's playing multi-level chess. On one level, he's working out his own purposes in the world. On another level, he's refining and purifying his people. On another level, he's building up my personal faith. On another level, he's building up your personal faith. You know, only God is big enough to do something like that. Only God can orchestrate things in such a way that each person experiences the best possible outcomes all while God's will is being done on earth. Everyone gets blessed all the way around and the kingdom of God goes forward. That's what God was doing in Zarephath. The name Zarephath means the refinery. What was God's purpose? Sending his prophet to mooch off of a widow. It was to refine Elijah's faith for the victories that were yet to come in his life. Elijah's obedience to the Lord is amazing here. You know, it wasn't too much of a stretch to hide in the wilderness and drink from a brook. Okay, getting fed by ravens, that's a little weird, but you know, God has provided in the desert for his people before. But this... You have got to be kidding me, God. Jezebel's homeland, a Gentile widow, a single mother. Maybe Elijah reasoned along the way, it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. Maybe he thought perhaps God was sending him to a Greenwich widow. <laughs> you know, Leona Helmsley, her house just sold for $65 million here in Greenwich. And he thought maybe, maybe it's not as bad as it sounds. But when he got to the city gate, he saw her picking up sticks and he said, oh boy, it really is as bad as it sounds. He asked her for a jar of water. You know, even that was a precious commodity in a drought. And she went to get it without saying a word and he asked for some bread. And when she replied that she had nothing but a handful of flour and a spot of oil for her last meal, suddenly Elijah knew why God sent him there. And boldly, he asked her for her last cup of flour. God sent Elijah to Zarephath to grow his faith. Elijah learned to trust God's care for him even more. He learned that God could protect him anywhere even more. He learned to discern God's voice even more. He learned to trust God's very unusual way of leading even more. He learned to believe God for things that had never been seen or done before. James wrote something very encouraging to us about Elijah. He said, Elijah was a man just like us. And you know, looking at Elijah's life, I find that's true. Elijah was not immune to discouragement. He wasn't immune to weariness. He wasn't immune to self-pity. Elijah didn't just want to quit the ministry. He actually quit the ministry. He said, God, I am so done with you. Elijah was depressed to the point of wishing that he could die. And some of us have been there too. Elijah was a man just like us. He wrestled with the same temptations as us. He endured the same tests and trials as us. He buckled under the same human weakness as us. And that's why he needed the experiences at Zarephath to refine his faith. Listen to me. There would have never been a historic showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal if God had not first sent Elijah to Zarephath where his faith grew day by day. Beloved, listen, there's a word from the Lord for someone in this house this morning. The experiences that you're passing through today, they are simply God's way of refining your faith. The hardships that make you cry out to God.
the difficulties, the frustrations, the circumstances you can't control. God is using all of those things. There's a Mount Carmel in your future. There's a glorious victory in your future. And God is using those things to prepare you. James said, count it all joy when many types of hardships befall you, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and endurance produces Christian maturity so that you are complete, not lacking anything. How many of you like to be complete, not lacking anything? Then be patient in Zarephath. But Zarephath wasn't for Elijah alone. Remember, God was playing multi-level chess. God sent Elijah to the widow's house for the widow's sake. He didn't send Elijah to burden her. He sent Elijah to bless her. We don't know very much about this woman. She was a Gentile. She was a widow. She had a son and in this present famine she was one meal away from starving. She wasn't a worshiper of Yahweh. She wasn't a worshiper of the God of Israel. In fact, her unbelief was rather persistent. It took her a long time to become convinced about Elijah and his God. And yet Jesus said that God passed over all the other widows in Israel and he sent Elijah to this Gentile widow instead. What was the spark of faith that God saw inside of her? You know, God who alone searches the hearts of men and women saw in the heart of this woman an inclination to say yes to him. She wasn't offended by the prophet's invitation. She wasn't offended by his request for water. She wasn't offended by his request for bread. She said yes because she recognized him to be a prophet. You know, some people get offended by the invitation to become God's partner. Can I be honest? Everyone likes church buildings, but not everyone likes the process by which those buildings get here. <laughs> buildings are popular. Building campaigns, eh, not so much. <laughs> How could we ask hardworking families and single moms and students and seniors to give sacrificially? How could we place a burden on people who are already working hard enough to get by. A lot of believers don't get it, but you know this Gentile widow, she did. There was something exceptional about her. She didn't say, oh great, a prophet just showed up and asked me for my last piece of bread. Instead she said, great, a prophet just showed up and he asked me for my last piece of bread. In her moment of desperation, she saw in Elijah's arrival a glimmer of divine providence and it produced a spark of hope inside of her and she decided to take a chance on the God of Israel. Yeah. Elijah told her, do not be afraid. And all of a sudden, she wasn't anymore. You know, that's a word from the Holy Spirit for someone in this house. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God is with you. In an instant, she believed what the Jewish people had failed to believe for centuries. She believed in the kindness of God. She believed in his word of promise. She believed that God could do big things through the little bit in her hand. Beloved, listen to me. Take this home to the bank. Just a little bit of faith is better than a whole barrel full of flour. <laughs> Hosting his prophets is better than hoarding your prophets. The wisdom of this word is better than the wisdom of this world. I want you to notice something with me from this story. God measures out his miracles of provision in a way that meet our need for spiritual growth. H have you ever wanted to be happy for a friend who received a miracle, but it's just really hard because you're still waiting for your miracle. <laughs> From 1999 to 2004, it took us five years to raise $3 million to buy this land and build this building. That's not how much it cost. It cost $6 million, but we raised $3 million towards it, and it took us five years to do it. And for those of you that were with us on that journey, it was a grind all the way. Fasting and praying 
and sacrificing and giving. We had people in our congregation who really deferred some, some big things in life just to sacrifice. And I remember during that time, one of my pastor friends called me all excited. He had a, a church he had planted. The church was growing and they needed a building. And they were offered a landmark building in a primo location for $1. And he told me that the phone call he received from the owner of the building was a mistake. Another church had approached the owner of that building and had asked to, to receive the building. And the owner, he misdialed and he didn't call the church he spoke to. He called my friend instead. And my friend said, I'm sorry, sir, you had the wrong number. We, we didn't talk to you. It was someone else. And he said, well, do you want the building? And so they got the building for one dollar. And I remember talking to my friend, I'm saying, that's great. I'm so happy for you, brother. Praise the Lord. I wanted to be happy, I really did. But I was still waiting for my miracle. And then we finished this building, we moved in, and I had another friend, and they needed, their congregation was growing, and they needed to build, and so he asked me, and I hooked him up with all the people that had been part of this project, and, and all the professionals that had helped us, and so they launched a capital campaign. And so I, I thought I'd give him a call one day, just a courtesy call, just to see how things were going, and, and I called him, and I said, how's your campaign going? And he said, it went well. <laughs> And I said, you mean the launch? The launch of the campaign went, went well. He said, oh no, we're all done. They raised $15 million in two months. And I said, I'm so happy for you. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Come on. I know you all look at me spiritual. I know you've been there too. So I was complaining to the Lord about it in my office, sitting in my chair, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, Glenn, it's not because of what I need, but because of what you need. Can I tell you that the sacrifices that he asks us to make, they are for our sake. They are not for his sake. It's so that we can grow in faith through the supernatural act of sowing and reaping, giving and receiving. You see, not all building projects in the Bible are alike, and not all miracles of provision are alike either. To some, God gives everything that's needed all at once, and to others, God gives what is needed just one day at a time. God gave manna and quail to the Israelites one day at a time for 40 years. He sent ravens to Elijah one day at a time. He gave grace to Paul one day at a time for the rest of Paul's life. And God renewed the widow's flour and oil one day at a time. I want you to catch this about this miracle. For three and a half years, there was never more than one cup of flour in her jar and one tablespoon of oil in her jug. It never looked like there was going to be anything left, but there always was. Maybe you can relate. God, there's not going to be enough. There's not going to be anything left, but for three and a half years, her faith went first every day. Why does God do it that way? Well, it's because that's how stubborn unbelief is. It took three and a half years of daily miracles to convince both Elijah and the widow that they really, 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 really could trust God. That he would take care of them no matter what. That little is much when God is in it. Why has God chosen a harder road for us here at harvest time than some of our friends? You know, I don't really know. And when I get to heaven, I intend to ask that question. But I do know this. My friends, I bless them. I love them. I thank God for them and their ministries. But you know, they're done building everything they're going to build. But we're building more. Amen. Yeah. So maybe, just maybe, God knew back then we were going to need more faith because we still have a lot further yet to go. Yeah. Encouraging words about God's economy. God will take care of you. 
God will take care of his work on earth through you. And finally this, worship team, you can help me by stretching your faith. God will prepare you to do miraculous things that have never been seen before. Amen. Beloved, listen to me. Especially if you're in Zarephath right now. If God has you in a place where just day by day you're trusting him to help you make it through. Listen to me. Day by day your faith is growing toward a moment when you will ask God to do something that has never been seen before. After three and a half years of living on the bottomless cup of flour, the widow's son got sick. He grew worse and worse every day. What an irony that is. Every day this woman's faith is going first. Every day she's offering her last cup of flour and her last tablespoon of oil. And every day while she's doing that, her son is getting worse and worse. Ever had a situation in your life like that before? God, I'm doing everything. God, I'm, I'm obeying. God, I'm trusting. God, I'm just doing everything I know how to do. And this thing, it's not getting better and better. It's getting worse and worse. Finally, the boy died. Overcome with grief, she said to Elijah, Why did you come to my house? Your presence here has attracted God's attention to me. He saw my sins. He took my son. But Elijah took that boy's cold body up to his room and he asked God to do something that had never been seen before. Beloved, this is the first instance in the Bible of a dead person being raised to life again. Abraham believed, he was fully persuaded that God could do such a thing. That's why he was able to lay Isaac on the altar, but God stopped him. Abraham believed God could do it, but no one had ever seen it done before. But Elijah's faith had been forged over three and a half years of daily trusting God. God, if you can guide me from Kareth to Zarephath, if you can hide me in plain sight from Ahab and Jezebel, if you can provide for me day by day through ravens and widows, then I believe that you can do anything. Let this boy's life return to him. God heard Elijah's cry and the faith of a Jewish prophet and a Gentile widow were made perfect. The widow said, now I know that you are a man of God and the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. Not for nothing, but really? Like the three and a half years of flour, like that wasn't enough? You see, that's how stubborn unbelief is. And that's why God has to work in ways that he proves himself to us over and over again. Beloved, listen to me. With every faith sacrifice that you make, you are sowing into future miracles that you don't even know you're going to need yet. You're sowing into your family's future. You're sowing into your children's future, your grandchildren's future. You're sowing into the future of the church. The widow didn't know it, but every day that she offered her last cup of flour to Elijah, she was sowing into an epic miracle for her son. When you get to heaven, Jesus is going to remember every faith sacrifice that you ever made on behalf of the gospel, on behalf of his church. Jesus is going to honor you for that. He didn't forget this widow's faith. He didn't forget that she said yes to Elijah, that she said yes every day for three and a half years, and Jesus honored her for that. There was no shortage of widows in Israel during the famine, but God sent Elijah to this woman. Jesus will honor you too. He's going to say, I remember you. I remember what you did. You cried out to God because you wanted to bless my church. You wanted to advance my kingdom on earth. You wanted to send the gospel across the suburbs of New York City and all around the world. You wanted to invest in the next generation. You didn't get offended by the invitation to be my partner. You prayed and you listened. You gave. And because you did what I, what you did, I did what I did. And people received miracles that had never been seen before. 
Beloved, can I tell you in phase two, we're going to see miracles that have never been seen before. I've already seen a glimpse of it. I've already seen a little bit in my dreams. The Lord has already shown me. When our faith has been perfected through sowing and reaping, through giving and receiving from God, when that building is built, God is going to get all the glory. The sacrifices of a poor widow and the faith of a prophet combined to produce a miracle the world had never seen before. A little boy was raised from the dead and when God saw that, he said, now, Elijah, you're ready. Now, go your, show yourself to King Ahab. Now, go to Mount Carmel and show this nation that the Lord, he is God. How many of you know that America needs to know that the Lord, he is God? That Jesus, he is God? We're going to show him in phase two. When God wants to bless you, he gives you an opportunity to give. Beloved, this isn't to burden you, it's to bless you. Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place. Oh, come on, give Jesus a great big praise in this place.